Thank you, Sister Bailey. <clears throat> I would like to start a new series of sermons today on the holy city, New Jerusalem, <clears throat> based on the last two chapters of the book of the Revelation. And uh, I thought about this for quite a while, maybe too long. I've, I've been a little bit hesitant to do this because I know that this has been a subject of our discussions a lot recently, especially chapter 21. Uh, not too long ago, one of our preaching festivals, this was the theme, and all the brethren spoke from Revelation chapter 21. And for our men's fellowship meetings, our uh, theme is the church. And just a few weeks ago, Brother Aaron led us in a discussion about the city of the living God. So uh, I, I don't want to get up here and just say things that have already been said and just repeat because that's uh, not the nature of uh, good preaching. It's just I think it was Brother Given mentioned just a, a few minutes ago about the freshness of the Word of God. Um, but I also took into consideration that uh, my last series was on the fall of Babylon. I thought I ought to give at least the same equal time to the <laughs> the eternal city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the one that will never fall. <clears throat> also something I've, uh, I've uh, kind of, I guess, made my own custom, my own habit, if you want to call it that, uh, is sometimes you'll find yourself, maybe you'll be preparing for a sermon or to lead a ladies' fellowship meeting, and you'll have things in your mind, and you'll, you'll come to a, a, one of the gathering of the saints, and you'll find that what you've been thinking about and studying about, that subject has come up. And you're kind of hesitant to share because, well, I want to save that for when it's my turn to speak. But now something I've learned, I, and I, I haven't mastered this, but I, I've learned to go ahead and give what you've got. And trust the Lord to give you some more when your turn to speak comes up. And so that's kind of what I'm doing here. I've... Um, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord to show, show us some new things here so that I don't, I'm not staying up here and just being repetitive, saying things that, that have already been observed recently. <clears throat> what John was given to see here in these last two chapters of the book of the Revelation is the, a vision of the final rest of the saints, and it's actually God's final rest also that he sees here. This is when, when everything comes together. This is like the, the, the dividing line that, that this is where the present world ends, where enmity and opposition ends, and where eternity begins. This is just the starting line here that John describes for us in these two chapters. <clears throat> so it's wonderful to see this. The holy city, New Jerusalem, is yet to be completed, and it's yet to be revealed, although John here sees a vision of it <clears throat> in these last two chapters. In the new and eternal era, the New Jerusalem will be the only dwelling place for God and for His people. So there won't be any more separation of saints like we experience now. Here, we're some here and there's some there. There's some in this city and there's some way over here in this other city. This, this is the end of all of that. There's no more separation of saints, no more separation of God from His people. This is where we all come together. And John's describing the place. <clears throat> so the eternal city is not Rome despite that this has become a, a cliche or a saying among men, Rome is certainly not the eternal city. It's kind of humus, really, about half of it's in ruins already. <clears throat> there are a great number of earthly cities that have already been standing much longer than Rome and inhabited much longer than Rome. Rome is not the city that God has chosen. In fact, the city that God has chosen... <clears throat> There is, well, let me say it this way, there's no city in this world that is eternal. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. <clears throat> Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens 
and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. But John, in this vision, didn't see Rome. And he didn't see a new Babylon. But he did see a holy city, the new Jerusalem. In his vision of the book of the Revelation, John saw what Peter told us to look for, the text I just read in 2 Peter chapter 3. New heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. I like that Peter adds that on. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now the city of Jerusalem that presently exists in the world, God has put this in place to teach us about this holy city, the new Jerusalem, this eternal city. Jerusalem in the present world is given to teach us about it. <clears throat> he is, this is the city, I'm, I'm talking about Jerusalem in the present world. It's just the city where God has put his name. <clears throat> it's the one city in all the earth in which his temple was built. It is the one place in all the earth in which there was a most holy place where God himself was said to dwell above the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat between the cherubim. It is also the city that has the devils tried to take and to defile and claim as his own. Jerusalem is also known as Zion. This is known to be a stronghold and a fortress because of where it's situated. It's situated high on the earth. It's surrounded on three sides by, by steep ravines. So it's difficult to take the city, and no matter where you're coming from, you must go up to Jerusalem. Yeah. The first time the word Zion is found in Scripture is in 2 Samuel chapter 5. The Jebusites inhabited Jerusalem. They were the descendants of Canaan, who was the son of Ham, Noah's son. And the Jebusites inhabited the city of Jerusalem until David took it. And this is the first thing that David did after he was crowned king in Hebron. The scriptures just immediately following his crowning, all Israel came to Hebron to crown David, and immediately all Israel went to Jerusalem, and David took the city. So this is the first thing that David did as king. He, he claimed the high ground in the promised land. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David shall not come in hither. This uh, matter of the lame and the, the blind and the lame, there's several different views of this. If you read commentators, they have different things to say. My own view of it is that what, this is kind of a sarcastic remark where the Jebusites thought this city is so well fortified. It's so hard to get up the steep incline to this city. We could use our lame men and our blind men to fend off David. He, he can't come in here. He's not going to take this city. Well, the next verse says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. God had repeatedly said through Moses and Joshua that the Jebusites were some of the heathen in, the, in this promised land that he was going to drive out. <clears throat> and there were six other nations mentioned also. But until David was made king in Israel, this had not happened. Now this was a long time after Israel had taken the promised land. They were in the promised land a long time. In Joshua 15 Verse 63 says, As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. That's, that's prior to David. And also prior to David in Judges chapter 1, verse 21, the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. So David took, the, took Jerusalem from the Jebusites without commandment from God. See, I'm convinced he knew, well, of course he knew, this is what the word of the Lord was, that you, you take the promised land, take all of it. He knew this history that no one had driven out these Jebusites, and here they are, they're, they're in the highest spot in the land that they're occupying. Yeah. David, he's the king, he's... I'm taking that city first. And he, of course he did, and, and it's the capital city of Israel to this day. And it's still known as the city of David. Now you, you correlate that with, with Christ now. <clears throat> mm -hmm. <clears throat> David made Jerusalem his own home and the capital city of Israel. And later on, 
when David's home was built in 2 Samuel chapter 7, he looked out and he saw, you recall, the tabernacle and that the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And he thought to build a permanent dwelling place for the ark of the covenant and for God, again, without any commandment to do these things. Yeah. And God told Nathan the prophet to say unto David, And when thy days be fulfilled, this is just part of what uh, Nathan told him, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Solomon, you know, built the temple that David had planned and provided for. But God here, you know, he was speaking about someone other than just Solomon. <clears throat> so what I'm establishing here is that when, when and why God spoke about Jerusalem in the, the first time in the scripture. God permitted a house for his name to be built in the earth, and it was built in Jerusalem. David's the one who took the city and desired to build a temple for God there. <clears throat> so what I'm uh, attempting to show you here is that God did not choose Jerusalem until David, as a type of Christ, was made king. So actually, God chose it. This is kind of a, I admit, this is kind of a, a lower view, a subjective view, but God chose it because of David. It wasn't until after David took the city, after the temple was built, that David, David desired to build, then Solomon built it. After that, God chose the city. And now, looking back in this time, after the temple's built, God still, at this time, has not made any promises <clears throat> about Jerusalem or identified himself with the city. <clears throat> not until after the temple was built. And when Solomon sinned by marrying wives of the nations and left God to serve heathen gods of his wives, this is when God states that he had chosen Jerusalem. Now that sound, might sound like a strange context for God to say this in, but within the context of Solomon's sin, God states for the first time that he has chosen Jerusalem. The Lord spoke to Solomon in 1 Kings 11 and told him that the kingdom of Israel would be taken from him and divided because of his sins. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake mm -hmm. and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. That's the first time in Scripture, that's 1 Kings 11.13, the first time in Scripture that God says that he's chosen Jerusalem. <clears throat> now God did not reveal that he had chosen Jerusalem until his temple was there. And his temple was there because David desired to build God a permanent habitation there And David was the one who first took the city from the Jebusites. Therefore, if it were not for David, God would not have chosen Jerusalem as his city. Likewise, the new Jerusalem is the habitation of God for the same reason. The only reason that God has chosen the new Jerusalem to dwell in is because Jesus is the king and the designer and the builder of it. He is the seed of David, whose throne is established forever. God is his father and he is God's son. New Jerusalem is owing entirely to Jesus Christ. It's a city made up of persons that he has redeemed with his own blood. There's only one king in the New Jerusalem and only one king who could build the New Jerusalem. He is the one of whom it is said, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill. God set the king in Zion and the king made it into the city of God. Now this is how earthly Jerusalem came to be the city of God. It shows us that this is the origin of the new Jerusalem also. <clears throat> because of its association with God, Jerusalem is known and desired throughout the earth. The 48th Psalm you're familiar with is dedicated to the city of Zion. It is known, God, in it God is known and praised. It is beautifully situated in the joy of the whole earth. God is known in her palaces. God will establish it forever. Being in the temple there causes men to think of God's loving kindness. There are towers and bulwarks and palaces there in the city that tell accounts of God's mighty works there in the city. 
So the, the city itself is a testimony of God. God is known to dwell there. His name is there. His temple is there. His people are there. Because God is there, it's commonly understood that when the people of God are all gathered together, they're going to be gathered there to Jerusalem. Amen. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. In the 87th Psalm, the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Verse 5, And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. Amen. The new Jerusalem is actually the birthplace of the people of God. And this isn't just in the psalm. The apostle Paul confirms this in Galatians 4.26. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Amen. Jerusalem is also known as a city that's constantly being built up. David built it up. Solomon, Uzziah, Ezra, Ezra. Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, <clears throat> Joshua the high priest, Haggai, Zechariah, all these were builders in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Psalm 147.2, The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcast of Israel. Mm -hmm. And this too is confirmed in the New Covenant. Ye also as lively stones are be built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now in view of these things and in many others, the city of Jerusalem in the present earth is a foreshadow or a type of the new and heavenly Jerusalem. But now there are some limitations to this. If we're going to liken earthly Jerusalem to heavenly Jerusalem, there are some things we're going to have to leave out. <clears throat> For example, Jerusalem and the earth has been occupied and controlled by the heathen many times over the years. And it's had to be retaken by the people whom God promised it to. But this cannot be said of the new Jerusalem. Amen. The new Jerusalem has never been and never will be defiled, nor require destruction. But Jerusalem and the earth has experienced this more than once. Jerusalem and the earth had to be conquered by an army and taken and rebuilt more than once by the labors of many people. It was besieged and destroyed by the Babylonians, later again by the Romans, and according to Wikipedia, for whatever that's worth, Jerusalem has been destroyed twice, besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, and captured and recaptured 44 times. But New Jerusalem is being built up by just one man. Amen. When it is complete, it will be a holy place which is not defiled and cannot become defiled. The city will be without opposition, without hindrance, and without any other contrary thing. It will never be destroyed or besieged or attacked or captured. Paul says, In the present now ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. All that's in Zion. Mm -hmm. And we are come to Zion now by faith, while we are still being chiseled out and shaped here in the quarry. But when what John saw in Revelation chapters 21 and 22 is what we are going to be incorporated into when faith has been done away with. It's the heavenly city as a finished work, built up as it will be forever. This city, New Jerusalem, is no ordinary city then. It is not even an earthly city. In fact, it cannot be revealed until proper preparations have been made for it. <clears throat> New Jerusalem cannot come down and take up residence in this corrupt world. God cannot dwell in His fullness in a place like this. So there has to be a lot of preparation for New Jerusalem. Not only is the city being built, but the environment for the city must be prepared. And now this is, this is the backdrop of what John sees in Revelation chapter 21 in this first verse. He's, seen, he's just telling us the background now the backdrop for the city. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, 
and there was no more sea. <clears throat> now this can be the only proper environment for New Jerusalem. Just before this in chapter 20, Jesus made the final preparations for the city of God. Jesus told his disciples, and this is a word to us too, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And he's also preparing a place for his Father. Now back in chapter 20, at verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works." And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now that's, that's the final cleanup right there. That's, that's the end of it all. The devils cast in the lake of fire. The corrupted earth and heavens pass away. They're folded up. The human race is judged both small and great. Death and hell have to give up everything that's in them and they're cast into the lake of fire along with all those who were not found written in the book of life. Now, it is said of God that Jesus' scepter is a scepter of righteousness. So Jesus is going to get rid of all things that offend <clears throat> before he presents this holy city. So John says, and I saw. <clears throat> now, just for a few seconds here, I do want to give attention to these words, and I saw. This is something that John states 33 times in the book of the Revelation. <clears throat> and I thank God that he gave John this vision. There's, it's something visual to see. There's, you know, what, what John wrote in the book of the Revelation, there's bits and pieces of it found all over in other scripture. But here in this vision, it's like you see it all come together. And it's wonderful to see it this way. <clears throat> all come together in one vision, and it's from a heavenly perspective too. <clears throat> and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. <clears throat> Notice that John did not say, and I saw God create a new heaven and a new earth. No, just immediately following what we saw in chapter 20, immediately after that, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's as if they were already there. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> just not seen before. In Genesis 1, the account is given of how God created the first heaven and earth. They were spoken into place. Light was made. Light and darkness divided their firmament to separate the waters. <clears throat> the waters and the water on the earth. Dry land appeared. and God made vegetation. And he made the sun and the moon and the stars and all the planets. <clears throat> and he made all living creatures to fill the water and the land and the sky. This is a lot more detail than what we have that John saw in Revelation 21 because it, it, was, it was already there. Yeah. The new heaven and the new earth that John saw seems to be in place already. This new heaven and new earth that John saw has been the real and permanent heaven and earth all along. The language used by the Holy Spirit indicates this in other places. Hebrews 1.10, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth the garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. It's, it's just like a cloak. The corruption and the sin that covers the earth and the heavens right now, it's just like a cloak. When Jesus comes, he's going to fold it up and put it away, and the eternal will be revealed. <clears throat> This is why John says, and I saw, there it was. <clears throat> yeah. Amen. This is going to happen in due time. <clears throat> Peter says that we have a lively hope of these things to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed 
in the last time. So Paul speaks also about this change of the creation from the creation's point of view in Romans 8, verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered, as if it's a person. The creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So you and I are not the only ones looking for liberty now. There's a, there's a heavens and an earth that's covered in a cloak of corruption. They're looking for some liberty too. Amen. The cloak of sin and corruption that present, covers the present heaven and earth is like a bondage. Not only to the people of God, but also to the creation. And when the corruption is taken away, heaven and earth will not cease to exist, but they will be brought into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. That is, just as the saints are going to be clothed upon with immortality, so is the creation. In the resurrection, we will be rid of corruption. We will shed dishonor and weakness. We will be rid of the natural body and receive a spiritual body fit for the holy city, New Jerusalem, we shall bear the image of the heavenly in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Well, the creation is going to be delivered in the same time, and at the same twinkling of an eye. It shall be changed into the same glorious liberty. John saw the new heaven and the new earth for... The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. That's why he saw them, because the other were passed away. Amen. And as I said, I like the fact that Peter adds this, wherein dwelleth righteousness. <clears throat> and we might even add another word in there, wherein dwelleth only righteousness. <clears throat> While the bondage of corruption is a description of this present evil world, righteousness is the primary characteristic of the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. The shadow of this was experienced when Noah came out of the ark. <clears throat> there was, in a way, he was on the same earth and under the same heavens, but in another way, he was in a different earth. It had been cleansed and purged of all corruption and all defilement. For a short time, there were no more ungodly men or ungodly deeds or hard speeches spoken against the God. No matter where he went, the whole world was like this. All that remained were those that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. John saw now the fulfillment of this shadow that Noah experienced. He saw the fulfillment of this in this vision. And the saints are going to experience it after the judgment. Amen. John says this final phrase in verse 1, And there was no more sea. The devil, the beast, and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Jesus appears, and heaven and earth flee away. The judgment takes place in which all men are judged, and death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. John sees a new heaven and a new earth, but he also makes this statement, there was no more sea. Well, what does the sea have to do with all of this, we might ask? <clears throat> well, the sea is mentioned 26 times in the book of the Revelation. Although not every mention is speaking of the sea on the earth. In chapters 4 and 15, John speaks of a sea of glass that was before the throne. <clears throat> but all the other times in the book of the Revelation, the sea is in reference to the sea on the earth, the water. <clears throat> the creatures in the sea bless the Lord in chapter 5. It's commanded to the angels to not hurt the sea. An angel stands with one foot on the land and another foot on the sea. In chapter 13, John says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. One of the vials of wrath was poured out on the sea, and it became blood. An angel cast a millstone, into the sea. And in chapter 20, we already read where the, the sea gave up her dead. <clears throat> this is another passage. There are varying uh, opinions, if you want to call it that, and views of what is meant here. Um, I, I prefer to view it as both spiritual and physical. That is, it, I, I wouldn't want to limit this to just say there's not going to be any more trouble at the sea. And it, the sea does represent a lot of trouble for mankind. 
but I don't want to limit it to that only. It said that 71% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. <clears throat> Matter of fact, we call it the blue planet because there's so much water on it. <clears throat> it's no wonder that John, when he saw this, he took note. He adds this on here. He saw this. There was no more sea. That's, that's significant when we're talking about 71% of the surface of the Earth. <clears throat> the sea cannot be conquered by men, and it's uninhabitable. Since the seas consist of salt water, the, the water itself is of no use to man. When the sea becomes violent, it is a very destructive force. <clears throat> In John's vision, the beast rose up out of the sea. So here's the spiritual relation to it. There's a lot of trouble here that, that comes up out of the sea, out of the depths and out of the darkness, out of areas where you can't see and that are out of your control. There's a lot of wicked things that the devil brings up out of here. <clears throat> If there were no sea in the new earth, that would signify that all of the earth would become inhabitable. There would be no more troubled waters and changing weather patterns, and no more place for a beast like John saw in chapter 13 to rise up. So the sea, the sea can be beautiful to look at, and there are fish and other creatures in the sea that are very interesting, and a lot of it we eat for food. But as far as man is concerned, the seas are not really all that much different from a desert. There's, it's just, we use it to navigate across, but nobody lives in the sea. <clears throat> it's actually, it's like a waste area as far as human life is concerned. It's not accommodating to man. So suffice it to say that the meaning here is that there will be no more places like that in the new heaven and the new earth. <clears throat> what John saw in Revelation 21 verse 1 was glorious and yet there's so few details that he gives about this. He just simply says, I saw the new heavens and the new earth. You might think, well, what did it look like? How big was the earth? Were there trees and mountains still? How was, were the heavens, were they bigger or smaller than they are now? Were, were there just as many stars? I mean, there's all kinds of questions. You go back to Genesis and read all that God created. Here, here it is. 6,000 something, somewhere close to 7,000 years after God created the heavens and the earth and we still haven't even come close to discovering all of it. I, I looked on the internet, <clears throat> these two satellites, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, I thought they'd been, you know, they were sent out to space and they've been traveling for a long time and they take data down and they send pictures back every once in a while. I thought it'd been like 10 years. It's been 34 years. Yeah. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 have been out for 34 years. They haven't even reached the end of our little bitty solar system yet. So it's vast. So you might think, John, where are all the details? Well, what I want to tell you is that this isn't the main point. He's made, this, is, this new heaven and new earth is just a backdrop for what's about to come down. So those are some blessed things for you to contemplate. That will be in our next installment. <clears throat> If there is no use for a new heaven and a new earth, why would God have such things in place? <clears throat> so since you know these things are true and you look for them, brethren, I want to leave you with this exhortation, again from 2 Peter. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Amen. Amen.